usually said about character, character is what you do in the dark when no one is looking. And what we have to understand when it comes to godly character, it's not just isolated to our uh, appearance of what we're concerned about when no man is looking. But because we understand that God is omnipresent, he's everywhere at one time. We live our lives before an audience of one. And so godly character are people who have understood that my life belongs to Christ and it's my desire to please him. It's just as in the Bible with Jesus when he was being water baptized, the Bible says that uh, there was a voice that spoke from heaven. It was God the Father. And he said, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased. And so at that point, Jesus hadn't raised the dead. At that point, Jesus hadn't cast out of a, a demon. At that point, Jesus had not healed the sick. But it was the godly character that he displayed that was pleasing before his father. Okay? Now, we should be casting out demons, healing the sick, and raising the dead, all of that good stuff. But we have to understand the importance of having godly character as a born-again believer. Okay? So when we look at godly character, the key to favor, increase, and being a witness for God, I get the privilege to, to go to the book of Daniel and study his life. Other than the Godhead, Daniel is my favorite person in the Bible. You know, some people, they like David. David, you know, that's, that's, that's good and fine. But I like Daniel. Daniel is the, one of the few that I've ever found in the Bible who never missed a beat. And through what God was able to do in his life, there was no failure in Daniel. And he had an excellent spirit. And, you know, other than the Godhead, he's my favorite person in the word of God, okay? So when we're looking at godly character, the key to favor, increase, and being a witness for God, we're looking at the life of Daniel. First thing we're going to look at, God character, godly character, godly character is purposing in your own heart not to defile yourself. Let's go to Daniel 1 and 8. Now, let's understand this. David, uh, Daniel and the, the other children that had been with him, they had been taken captive into a foreign land. Now, that was part of the punishment of God because of their generations of disobedience, okay? So they were taken as captive. What they did, they took Daniel and three other young men who they felt like were the cream of the crop, and the king was going to train them so that he could have them to stand before them, uh, stand before the king as some of his wise men. Now, when we look at that, Daniel at that point in his time would be like going into his high school years. One of the things that most people believe is that Daniel and the other three young men that were taken into this training program, they were made into eunuchs. Now, what happens, and they were under the prince of the eunuchs, because, you know, usually if they had somebody and they were trying to make sure that they studied, they had a lot of things they had to learn. They had to learn different languages. They had to learn whatever knowledge that they had in that country, in that society, they had to learn it all. And so, you know, young man, your teenage years, you know, you're thinking about girls, you're thinking about this, that, and another. They wanted them to be focused. You see, because when you read about the life of Daniel, you never see anywhere where he had a wife or he was given a wife. You remember in Joseph's situation, uh, Joseph was put in a pit by his brothers out of jealousy. And then he was taken out of the pit and he was sold as a slave. And he was sold as a slave. Then he was uh, sold, uh, uh, sold as a slave in Egypt and he ended up in Potiphar's house. And then Potiphar's wife lied on him and he was put in prison. While he was in prison, he interpreted the dream of the butler and the baker who uh, the king had put in prison. And so what happened was uh, his interpretation was correct. And when the butler got back in his position, what happens, Daniel, uh, Dave, uh, who will be talking to Joseph, Joseph had told, me, told him, remember me when you get back in your position. And he did not, which was part of the God's divine plan, because if he would remember Joseph immediately when he got back, possibly they would have released Joseph. And then more than likely, he would have went home and he would have been out of place and out of pocket for what God wanted to do to bring about the salvation of not only uh, the seed which he planned to bring the Redeemer through, which was of the uh, children of Israel. Then, of course, it came out of the line, line of uh, lineage of Judah. But what we have to understand, uh, two years later, when he did uh, 
remember them because the, the king, no one could interpret the dream. They remembered them. Uh, then he remembered about Joseph, and he brought Joseph out of the prison, and the king, he interpreted the dream, and then uh, Pharaoh put him in an exalted position over everything in Egypt. And then one of the things that happened, he was given a wife, okay? Now, in Daniel's situation, because they were in this training uh, program and they wanted them to really focus, most people believe that he was made into a eunuch. Now, so, or he was castrated. So when you look at this, okay, here he is. He's taken captive out of his homeland. Now, out of the, all the people of captivity, now he's taken captive into this training program. And even though he is exposed to the best of the best, he gets to eat what's at the king's table. Now, what you have to realize as a Jew, uh, there were laws, food laws that they had as a Jew. And so, of course, you know, there were certain animals you could eat, you couldn't eat. If they, had a, um, if they chewed the cud, usually you could eat those. And then if they um, had other things about them, you couldn't eat them, you know, because they had clean and unclean animals. Here in the New Testament, we can eat anything. We want to eat as long as we sanctify it in prayer. Of course, we need to use wisdom uh, as far as keeping our flesh under control as well as knowing that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. But anyway, so, you know, that stuff wasn't kosher. It still had the blood in it. So they weren't really supposed to eat it, but they're away from their parents. They're away from the priests. They're away from the other people that knew them and loved them. And so he and the other three young men, they had an opportunity to do whatever they wanted to do. But when it comes to godly character, it's not about who's around. It's not about who sees you and who knows you. When it comes to godly character, you're just concerned about being pleasing in the eyes of God. So, amen? amen? Let's see the decision he made. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself, okay? And so what happens is, when it's godly character, it's something that you do in your own heart. You purpose in your own heart not to defile yourself. Things that you know that the Bible calls sin, whether you totally understand it or not. I was sharing with someone recently, uh, when, when you're dealing with a lot of people now in our society, in our culture, they feel like for them to obey the word of God, they have to understand. And so what happens, and, and let me clarify, okay? Uh, the Bible says marriage is honorable and all the bed is undefiled, whoremongers and, and adulterers, God will judge. So if, if I'm a believer and I hear that, okay, when it comes to fornication and adultery, I'm out. I'm not going to place myself under the judgment of God. The Bible calls that sin. But there are some people, well, they want to know why would he call it sin. Okay? So I think on a weekend I went back, I dealt with origin and things like that. Whether you understand why God calls something sin or not, when you have a desire to be pleasing before the Lord, you obey it as soon as you find out that it's sin. Okay? And so here he was, uh, uh, he was away, and because he had purpose in his own heart not to defile himself, do anything that was sin according to the Old Testament, according to the law of Moses. According to that, he decided he wanted to please God, so he wasn't going to do anything to defile himself. Let's look at the benefit, favor, and increase. Let's go to Daniel 1 and 19. Daniel 1 and 19, and it says, And the king communed with them, and among them all was not found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. Verse uh, 20, And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all of his realm. Now, why was this? It was because when he had the opportunity to eat everything that was on the king's table, even drink the king's wine, because those things would have been sin for him to do as a Jew, he found another way. He asked, and, you know, God gave him favor. He asked that he could get, eat something different. So he asked for something that we might consider uh, vegetable soup and water, okay? And so he asked for that, and then 10 days later when they checked him, he was more healthier and he was stronger. They were healthier and stronger than the others, so they let them continue to eat that. And because of just the desire of their hearts to be pleasing in the sight of God, what happens? The result of it was favor and increase. See, sometimes people think it does not pay to serve God. See, God is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, how you minister and do minister to the saints. Whatever you do for God, God will make sure that there's a payday, and that payday will be blessing, that payday will be favor, and that payday will be increase, okay? 
Second thing we're looking at godly character. Godly character is having dependency on God in every situation. Let's go to Daniel 2 and 13. Here it states, it says, And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. So that program that he was in as a teenager, he had got out of it, and all of those that were being trained to be wise men, men to stand before the Lord, they were about to all be slain. Verse 14, here it states, And Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom in a rock, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said unto Arach, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? When Arach made the thing known, then the Arach made the thing made to, known to Daniel. Verse 16, then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. See how he not only had wisdom, see how he not only had favor, but he had boldness to go before the king and to ask him, just give us a little time. Verse 17, then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Verse 18, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Verse 19, then was the secret revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Some people think that uh, dreams and night visions are the same. I do not. I believe a vision is a vision and a dream is a, vi a dream. And a night vision simply means that you had that vision at night, okay? But anyhow, he had a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Well, what was the benefit? What was the benefit? of uh, him having godly character dependency on God in every situation. See, what happens is he was in that situation where the king was going to have all the wise men killed. Now, his dependency was not in the king. If his dependency would have been in the king, he would have fell apart because that's who he was trusting in. And the one that he was trusted in would have made the decree that they all had to be slain. So, therefore, he would have had no hope. And see, a lot of times we have situations, whether there's a rumor that they're going to be pink slips passed out, whether there's a rumor this department is going to be closed, whether there's a rumor about this, that, or another, if your dependency is in the job, you fold, you frazzle, you fall apart because that's who your dependency was in. Because Daniel's dependency was never in the king, his dependency was in God. He was able to keep his composure. He was able to keep his, quote, unquote, wits about himself because he was never dependent on the king for his life anyway. He was dependent upon God. Let's go to Daniel 2 and nine, uh, 19. Daniel 2 and 19. Uh, we just read it. Then was the secret revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So we receive what? Spiritual revelation and promotion when we have character, godly character, and having dependency on God in every situation. So we see the spiritual revelation. God revealed it to him in a night vision. Let's see the promotion. Let's go to verse 46. Verse 46, 2 and 46, and here it states. Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer oblation and sweet odors unto him. And the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is God of gods and the Lord of kings and revealer of secret, seeing that thou couldst reveal this secret. Verse 48, then, Daniel, uh, then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Verse 49, and Daniel requested of the king, he didn't forget about his boys. He didn't forget about those who he was in covenant with. He didn't forget about his prayer partners. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Now, when you look at the life of Daniel, the influence that Daniel made upon that region in two administrations. 
was so tremendous when we go forward, generations forward, and even though we know Jesus was the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth, according to the book of Revelations, even though we know according to Isaiah 7 and 14, behold, a virgin shall conceive a son, his name shall be called Emmanuel. And so it was already prophesied that the virgin would conceive the son. When the, it was God's appointed time for the virgin Mary to conceive uh, Christ Jesus, the Messiah, what happens is the three, what the Bible calls uh, wise men or magi, they came from this region. The impact, the influence that God, that God used Daniel to have on that region and among those people, recognizing God to be the God of all gods. God to be the revealer of secrets, God to be the king of kings and the lord of lords, what happens that that continued on from generations, generations, people groups to people groups, that, that area in which he lived his life and influenced and impact those people, they're the ones who saw the star. And because of the writings that they were also uh, familiar with of the Jewish people because of the impact that they, uh, Daniel made on their lives, that's why they came. To bring gifts into the king that was to be born because of the influence and impact that Daniel had on their lives they knew about the king of kings and the lord of lords all right and so God wants your life to influence people who, who don't know the Lord, that don't have a Christian background, that don't know the difference between this religion and that religion, to know that there is a true and living God because of your godly character and your impact. Third thing, godly character, the key to favor, increase in being a witness for God. Godly character will not compromise the word of God to save yourself. And see, that's a real temptation. You know, you want to kind of uh, change the word just a little bit to save your own neck. Let's go to Daniel 3 and 16. Daniel 3 and 16, and here it states, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to, to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. So what had happened was they had decided to make this, this image. And then when all these instruments would be played, what would happen, everybody was to bow down and to worship that image. Anybody who did not bow down and worship the image will be thrown into a fiery furnace to be destroyed, okay? And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they wouldn't do it. Why? Because they were Jews, and they were supposed to worship God and God only. Verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him. And have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. And their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. Verse 30, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the providence of Babylon. Now, what we see is through what Daniel did, not only did he get promoted, but he remembered his prayer partners. Now, they standing on the word for themselves, displaying godly character for themselves, they get promoted themselves and see what we have to understand God will always reward you he will always stand up for you but we can never try to put him in a box he won't be in it we can never try to figure out how he's going to do it we just have to have confidence that he will <laughs> final thing Godly character is having an excellent spirit and being faithful. You know this comes from your personal time with God, so you won't jeopardize it for anything. Let's go to Daniel 6 and 3. Now, part of the key of having um, personal time with God is making an appointment. Because what happens is when we, you know, I include myself, 
When we get to the point where we make sure we read, but we don't have an appointment. We make sure we pray, but we don't have an appointment. What happens is there will be days and times where we won't read and we won't pray. And it has to get to a point. I know years ago when I was a runner, what happened is if something happened where that day I could not run, it just didn't feel right. And what happens, I might even get up late and go ahead and run because I had not run. And it just seemed like something wasn't right because I didn't run that day. Yet when it comes to the Word of God, it's amazing how the children of God can say, I didn't read my Bible, but when it's time to go to bed, it's too late to read tonight. I'll get you tomorrow, go, Lord. Well, I didn't pray today, and I'm going to bed. I'll I, I catch you tomorrow, God. And so what we have to understand, they're, they're, part of that secret is having an appointment. And one of the things when we look at having an appointment, when you have an appointment with God, especially not only an appointment time, but in addition, an appointment place, over a period of time, what you would find, when you walk into that appointment place at that appointment time, the Spirit of God is already there to meet you. He's already there. Because he's faithful even when not. He's there to make his appointment. Lionel Harris, uh, Linnell, what was his name? Lionel Harris uh, had one of, the, uh, one of my favorite songs. It was, I miss my time with you. Those moments together. I need to be with you each day. This was God speaking. I need to be with you each day. And it hurts me when you say you're too busy. Too busy trying to serve me. But how can you serve me when your spirit's empty? And then God goes on. There's a longing in my heart. Wanting more than just a part of you. It's true, it's true, it's true, it's true. I miss my time with you. Okay? And so what we have to understand, it's not just about, quote, unquote, being religious. Because some people feel like, well, to tell people to read their Bible every day is being religious. That's not being religious. That's instilling relationship and developing relationship with the Lord God. Okay? And when we don't come, it's more than what happens to us. Because Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Now, I know most of the body think he's lying, but he's not. Because we go days without reading our Bible, days or weeks without praying. And what happens is we feel like we're still good. But what we don't understand, God misses his time with us. And it's just like with Samson. You remember how when he, uh, he had a Nazarite vow. There are various parts of a Nazarite vow. Of course, the one we're all familiar with as far as not cutting of the hair, but also not drinking wine and not touching the dead. And so he touched the dead, even though that was part of breaking the Nazarite vow. And he touched the dead and nothing happened, or it seems as if nothing happened. He still had his strength and he was able to go on as he had been. And then another time he did what? He touched the dead. And even though he touched the dead, which was breaking the Nazarite vow as well, he was still able to go on as if nothing had happened. And then finally, when he broke the Nazarite vow, when he told um, Delilah where his strength lies, and, and they came in and they cut his hair, what happens? They had wrapped him up as they had before when he had lied to them about what, where his strength lied. And what happened was each time when they would say the Samson, the Philistines are upon you, he had the strength of God and he was able to break free and he was able to uh, uh, deliver himself. However, when he got to the point where the last part of that Nazarite vow, which was in the cutting of the hair, and when it, came, it happened, he thought that he was going to be able to deliver himself through the power of God as in previous times. But he was not. And when God says, when Jesus says, without me, you could do nothing, he's not lying. But because there's been time after time after time when we missed our time with him, those moments together, we hadn't been in prayer, we hadn't been in the word, and we keep on moving. And it seems as if it really didn't matter. There comes a time because God is not a liar. And if Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing that we fall on our face, not because God doesn't love us, because to go the amount of time that we've gone without being in his presence is nothing but the grace and the goodness of God. But there comes a time because he is not a man that he can lie. If he says, without me, you can do nothing, we fall on our face because we refuse to spend time with him. And when we're not understanding that, we go days, we go weeks, we go years, we go months, we go periods of time in our lives where we literally ignore the presence of God, where we literally ignore reading our Bibles, we literally ignore praying, we literally ignore doing these things. And because we go on and it seems as if Jesus was lying, 
Without me, you can't do nothing. Then there comes a day and a time when that grace lifts. It comes a day and a time when that power lifts. And then we find out for ourselves he wasn't lying. Without him, we can't do anything. <laughs> Daniel 6 and 3. Now here it says, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the president and the princes uh, sought to find occasion against Daniel. Okay, what we have to understand now, now da Daniel is under his second administration. That's very rare for somebody to be able to be in a, um, uh, a high position under two different administrations, okay? Then the president and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. That's why I like him better than David, nothing personal David. Okay, verse 5. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Verse 6, then these presidents and princes assembled together uh, to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. Verse 7, all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors of the princes, uh, and the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or any man for 30 days, save of thee or accept of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Verse 8, now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it shall not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Let's go on. Let's go to verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open. He wasn't doing it secretly. In his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. And see, what helps us when situations are uh, challenging, when we're going through trials and, and, and situations, when the pressure is on, what helps us to continue to pray is that now it's a part of our custom or an appointment. You remember in the Bible they talk about how Jesus went to the temple as his custom was? We need to have an appointment with God. Part of that appointment with God is we know, hey, Wednesday night, that's my night. The crudest morning I told him, Wednesday morning, that's, 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 that's my appointment with God. On the weekend, we have Saturday night at 6, Sunday 8 or 11. One of those times, that's my appointment with God. Of course, some come up, you can get one of the other ones. But the consistency comes, consistency comes in when we make an appointment. When we just say, well, I'll show up whenever. Well, sometimes it happens that we can't show up because other things came in the way because we never made it an appointment. Important. Anything that's important for us, we do what? We make an appointment. So we need to make an appointment when we know we come to the house of the Lord. We need to make an appointment when we know we pray every day. We need to make an appointment when we know we read our Bibles every day. Because if we don't make an appointment, two things is going on. One, we don't really think it's important. And two, it's more likely that when we get under certain situations, that's the first thing we'll stop doing. Let's go on. Well, what was the benefit? Godly character is having an excellent spirit, being faithful. We know uh, this comes from our personal time with God, so we won't jeopardize it for anything. Well, what's the benefit when we won't what? We won't jeopardize it for anything. God will shut the mouth of the enemy, and your character will speak for you. You will be a witness for God, and you'll prosper. Let's go to Daniel 6 and 21. Here it states, it says, then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. Now, this, is, this, this gets me about Daniel. Now, Daniel, Shadrach, and Amendigo, prayer partners, not only in that training program together, not only wise men together, not only being promoted and exalted together because of their godly character. I know. I can't find scripture for it. So you can, you can, you can put it in a dumpster if you want to. But I know they had to be praying for them kings. Nebuchadnezzar and now Darius. I know they had to be praying for them. And you might say, well, huh, maybe they weren't praying for them that much. Look at all the times they made these decisions. You know, with the, um, the image, whoever didn't bow down, be thrown into the fire every furnace. They couldn't have been praying too much or their prayers could not have been effective if they were praying for them to make those kind of decisions. Then you look at a new administration 
when Darius is now king, and Darius does something similar as far as, you know, you can't, uh, when the uh, other people get together to get him, you know, playing on his ego, to sign the decree where if anybody prays to anybody other than you, King Darius, for 30 days, they'll be thrown as the lion's den. See, we, the Bible says, Old Testament, our thoughts are not like his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. New Testament, once we get born again, we have the Spirit of God on the inside of us. We have been given the mind of Christ. However, if we do not take the time to get into the Word of God, our mind is not renewed. So in our minds, they could not have been pr praying for the people that were in authority over them. Why would they have made the decisions that they made? That's our thinking. With God, he wanted to change their hearts and change their lives. And so for him to do that, he had to cause them to see something different than what they've said, seen before. So he used his vessels. Now, if you're a born-again believer, you're one of his vessels, and he might want to use you sometime too. And so what happens, he used his vessels to show them and prove to them that he was the true and living God. Now, the reason why I am convinced that Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, uh, Azariah, Meshach, and Abednego, why I am so convinced that they spent time praying for the people over them in each administration, Nebuchadnezzar and now Darius, is because no matter what they went through, they came out with a right heart towards the king. They came out with a right heart towards the king. And see, some people, they can't sit under authority because they won't pray for authority. And so they always have a heart of offense. They always have a heart of unforgiveness. They always have a bitter heart towards leadership because they don't understand it's their responsibility to pray for those that have authority over them. Verse 21. Verse 21, it says, Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God. Now, this is what? This is after he was thrown into the lion's den. Hungry lions. And it says, My king, my God has sent his angels and has shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. Also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. And see, if you're not praying for those in authority over you, if you're not praying for leadership over you in the church, in the home, in the government, you will have what? You'll have offense in your heart. You'll be bitter against your heart, in your heart. And what happens, that will hinder you from being blessed by God. It's not hurting them because half the time they don't even know. You're the one that it hurts because God is more concerned with what goes on on the inside of us than what we outwardly do. And so when he was put in that, that lion's den, what happened? God was judging Daniel. Well, he should have been judging Daniel. He should have been judging the king. No, God was judging Daniel. And because he was able to judge Daniel while he was in the lion's den, he had no offense in his heart against the king. He had no offense in his heart against God because of what he went through. God delivered him. God blessed him. And God prospered him. And see, y'all can't shout on that because you all sit here today with offense in your heart against authority in your life. Authority in the home, authority in the church, authority on your job, authority in the government. And because you hold offense in your heart against those in authority over you because you refuse to pray for them, there's things in your heart that hinder you from being delivered, that hinder God from operating in your life. Verse 23, then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. He had faith and confidence in his God and his God also judged him while he was in the lion's den. And in judging him, he found him innocent. He wasn't holding any offense in his heart against the king. Darius, I've been serving you. I've been faithful. And here you, here you go and put me in a lion's den. He didn't have any offense in his heart against God. God, all of my life, all of my teenage life up to now, all of my life, I've been serving you. And see, what I really love about Daniel, I mean, as I said, other than the Godhead, he's my favorite person in the Bible. 
at the end, he was in his 80s. At the end of his life, one of the very last verses of the very last chapter, the last chapter of Daniel, it talks about uh, he was going to get his lot. What that meant is, you know, whatever, uh, uh, whichever one of the children of Israel, whichever one of those he was in, you know how Moses delivered them different land and spots? At the very end of his life, he was now going to get to go back to his homeland and he was going to get to get his possession of land that he was supposed to have in his homeland as a Jew. And see, what happens is, are we willing to allow God to use our lives in places we don't want to be, doing things we don't want to do, going through things we don't want to go through? And see, he's just looking for vessels. And so we go on, let's, let's go on, let's get to the tip of it. Let's go to 23, let's see how he got blessed. And it says, verse 23, then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den, uh, the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. Verse 24. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. You better be careful who you marry, because you can marry somebody, they go down, you can go down too. When it comes to children, you can't help who your parents are, but you can help who you marry. And the lions had the mastery of them and break all of their bones in pieces or ever they came to the bottom of the den. So all of these people and their children and their wives, and why, did the, why were the lions uh, doing all this to them? Because they were hungry. They were all night looking at uh, Daniel. <laughs> but they couldn't touch him, so they was really hungry. Verse 25. And then here it says, And the king Darius wrote unto all the people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. Verse 26, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Do you see how this administration, the last administration, they made it among all the people that this is the real God? That's why when it was time for the Messiah to be born, this is the region, this is the area where the wise men came from. But because of Daniel's life, and then I will add Mesh, uh, Daniel, uh, Meshach, Abednego, and uh, Azaria, because of their lives and their witness and allowing God to use them as vessels, for generations, the people in the east in that region knew that God was the true and living God. They knew the word. The word was precious. The scriptures were per precious to them. So they knew the Messiah was going to come. But when that star came, they believed that that was showing them where the Messiah was. But it was because of what? them willing to allow their lives to be used as a vessel and an instrument. Uh, 26 again, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Verse, and, and, his, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. Verse 27, and he delivered and, res he delivered and rescued. They still testify to what God will do. And he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in the earth and have delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus of the Persian. And so literally what we see is really three administrations, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, and Cyrus. Why? Because of his commitment and his godly character. Let's stand to our feet for a moment. Let's stand to our feet. And we're going to make a confession of faith. Let's just stretch our hands out before the Lord and just repeat after me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I repent for anything I've done to be a poor witness and a poor testimony. Anything that I've done to draw back from being a witness before you and before the world. Father, you purchased me with the blood of Jesus. And I belong to you. Everything I am, everything I'm not, everything I have, everything I've got, it belongs to you. So I offer and dedicate myself to you to be used as you would have me to be used. And Father God, your grace is sufficient for me. I thank you, Lord. I need the help of the Holy Spirit to be consistent and spending time with you. Spending time in the Word, 
Spending time in prayer, spending time in corporate fellowship, in church, I need your help. And from this day forward, I believe, I receive your help to be faithful in spending time with you so you can work the work that you've ordained to work through my life. Thank you, God, for the privilege of serving you. Thank you, God, for the privilege of belonging to you. Thank you, God, that I know your name and my name is inscribed in the palm of your hand. You know everything about me, every hair upon my head, every thought before I think it. And you still chosen to love me, to anoint me, to appoint me, to do your will. I am forever grateful. And I thank you, Lord. Every good seed that I have sown, I thank you, Lord. This is harvest time. I use my tongue as a sickle to harvest in the seeds that I've sown, that I've watered, that are ready to harvest, I call them in now. The financial seeds, the material seeds, the miracle seeds, the spiritual seeds, every seed that I've sown that's been watered and full grown, I call it in now. This day, this month, this year, I call in harvest on my seed that's ripe. And I thank you, Lord. You're going to do exceedingly, abundantly, above that which I can hope, ask, or think. I receive it all. I thank you, Lord. And it all belongs to you anyhow. You can get it all back. Do what you will. I'm just in love with you and doing your will. Thank you, God. Favor, blessing, promotion, increase in every area of my life. I receive it now, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory. Hallelujah. 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 We magnify you and we honor you. We exalt you, Lord God. We exalt you, Lord God. You've been faithful to us, God. It's in you that we live and move and have our being. Amen. <laughs>